Everybody ready? Okay. Uh, thank you for being here today. I'm so honored to stand with several extraordinary women leaders here in the state of Florida. Women's History Month is a chance to recognize the historic achievements of Florida's women. During this month, we remember the many contributions of women who strengthen the cultural, intellectual, and economic fabric of our society. From humble beginnings, Women's History Month started as a week-long unit organized by the school district of Sonoma, California in 1978 to recognize women's contributions to culture, history, and society. Now, it has grown to a nationally recognized month-long celebration of how far we have come and all the potential of where we will go next. And we still have a long way to go especially when it comes to equity and inclusion for women of color and LGBTQ women. I want to honor the legacy of the trailblazing women who fought to pave the way for future generations, to give their daughters and their granddaughters the chance to fully participate, to have the same rights and responsibilities guaranteed by the Constitution of this great nation. Now it is our turn to make the way a little bit easier. It is our turn to challenge the status quo of the gender gap pay, pay gap, to fight for paid leave and affordable childcare, to make sure the history and experiences of women of color and LGBTQ women is not erased, and to establish bodily autonomy as an, as an unalienable right, not a game in this culture of war. Each of the women we are celebrating here today has done the critical work of caring for their communities. They've shown their dedication through agriculture, education, journalism, activism, and public service. I am honored to have the opportunity to recognize their hard work today. And just in time. Um, like on cue. Uh, the first I'd like to recognize is Regina Livingston, founder of Unspoken Treasure Society. Regina has made important contributions to the people of Florida through her hard work to provide support and resources to the transgender and gender non-conforming community, providing peer support, community outreach, informational literature, HIV center testing and counseling through a trauma-informed restorative justice lens. Regina, your continued work to make sure that every transgender and gender non-conforming voice of color can be heard and equally understood it is un and invaluable, and it is an honor to recognize you here today and like to now give an opportunity to say a few words. Thank you. I'm totally honored and humbled to be here today to accept this award, this proclamation. Um, I feel like personally this award, or this proclamation doesn't go to just me. It also goes to all of the most marginalized communities in America because they're hurting, they're depressed, they're going through different things that is distracting their mental health. Our youth are under attack. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I thank you, but the thanks needs to be for community. The thanks needs to be for our marginalized individuals walking around feeling ostracized, feeling like they don't have anywhere to turn. So I appreciate this proclamation, but I appreciate more the backing of this legislation of understanding that we are human, we love, we bleed the same, and we need your help, not your hate. Thank you.
Thank you again, Regina, for your life-changing work. Now, I'd like to recognize Tallahassee's own Sherry Hall Alexander, who became the first black director of library services at Tallahassee Community College after growing up in a time when she and other black children were not allowed in the library. As director of library services for Tallahassee Community College and advisor of the Tallahassee Community College Black Student Union, she has made significant contributions to Florida's youth through her career in library services, counseling countless students, and encouraging young people to make their voices heard through voting. She also created Tallahassee Community College's African American History Month calendar, highlighting the accomplishments of local people of color. It is such a privilege to be able to recognize you here today. I'd like to invite you now to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Commissioner Free. To accept this proclamation, and it's not because of my works, but it's because of the changes that have been made in lives because of my being unselfish. It takes time for each of us if we would just take time and listen to our young people. They are hurting, they need us in every way. And if you cannot get over their everyday problems, then they cannot learn and educate. So I think it's very important that we listen to our young people, one to another. Also our elderly. I believe that I was born to be a servant and that's what I have done all of my life. Even during my retirement, I am still a servant to others. Whenever there's somebody's in need, I will go to their rescue and do whatever I can. Thank you again for this honor. I'm also honored to be joined here today by Stephanie Lorraine Pinero, an advocate for reproductive justice who has made important contributions to our healthcare access for all Floridians through her advocacy as the co-executive director of the Florida Access Network. As an abortion storyteller and a clinical social worker, columnist, and radio producer, Stephanie is helping to break a stigma around abortion care, bravely sharing her experiences and offering her truth in the pursuit of a more equitable Florida. Thank you, Stephanie. It is an honor to rec you here, recognize you here today. Uh, the microphone is yours. Hi everyone, I just want to uh, thank Commissioner Freed and her office for this recognition of my contributions to women's history. As I reflect on this journey that got me here, I think about how proud I am of 17-year-old queer me whose dream of a future where I could thrive didn't end when I knew I wasn't ready to be a parent. I saw my parents struggle to raise four children, and I learned from an early age that my place in this world is to ensure the people around me feel safe, feel loved, and have the resources to live their life with dignity. At Florida Access Network, we envision a world where people happily have the sexual and reproductive lives they choose free from violence, oppression, and injustice. We are manifesting communities that celebrate sex and sexuality and honor, honor, honor abortion as an act of compassion and radical self-love. Choosing to recognize this incredibly talented group of women from all walks of life is a testament to Commissioner Freed's commitment to the women and femmes of Florida and to reproductive justice. It also sends a message to all Floridians that no matter who you are and who you love, you deserve to call Florida, Florida home. Thank you, y'all. Now I'd like to recognize Shannon O'Malley, founder and chief executive officer of Brick Street Farms in St. Pete. As an urban farmer and entrepreneur, Shannon has made noteworthy contributions to the advancement of sustainable urban agriculture. She created innovative designs to repurpose the retired sh shipping containers to produce food in an urban environment in all seasons, while giving back to her community through food distributions. It is an honor to recognize you here today as a true innovator, and thank you for all that you do to bring new ideas to Florida's tables.
First of all, thank you so much on behalf of Brook Street Farms and my entire team. We would like to thank Commissioner Freed and her entire organization for the ongoing and continuous support of our organization. As a woman in the agriculture industry, and not only agriculture, but urban and indoor agriculture, we really are on the forefront. The amazing support your office has offered us continues to promote our mission to bring fresh produce to all communities. So thank you very much. Thank you. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to recognize Roz McCarthy, an advocate for equity, inclusion, diversity, and marijuana policies. Roz has made significant contributions to discussion around medical marijuana as the founder and chief executive officer of Minorities for Medical Marijuana, Inc. Roz's leadership and advocacy is vital, working to guarantee persons of color have a seat at the table when discussing medical marijuana policies and have equitable access to medical marijuana as a care option. These voices have routinely been, been excluded from opportunities in the industry, and we are so grateful for the work that you have done, Ross. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Man, thank you. Um, I don't want to cry, so I'm not going to. I am so appreciative of this recognition, because in 2016, when I started this journey in the state of Florida, was on the path of legalizing a medical marijuana program. I started Minorities for Medical Marijuana because I want to make sure that communities of color, disproportionately impacted communities, individuals that are not heard have an opportunity to not only have access to the card and to the medicine, but also have economic opportunities and being able to fight against social justice and being able to, you know, live free. And as this plant needs to be free, people need to be free from incarceration and from still being withheld from being able to operate because they have a record um, with a, a marijuana charge. I'm so excited about the work that I do. It comes from the heart. It's a passion. I live it. I breathe it. Um, my son is here today. He gets a chance to see his mom being able to be recognized for her hard work. And I'm so appreciative and so thankful. And I will be here and I will support our community, the state of Florida, and our program. And as we continue to grow, let's do it right. Let's make sure that it's opportunity for everyone. Thank you so much. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. And while they were not able to be here with us today, I want to share the remarkable stories and contributions of several other trailblazers that my office is also recognizing. This includes Dr. Sharon Wright Austin, a professor of political science at the University of Florida, has made important contributions to the study of African American women's political behavior, African American mayoral elections, rural African American political activism, and African American political behavior. Dr. Austin stood for freedom of speech and academic freedom in challenging the University of Florida's conflict of interest policy to make Florida a more place, more open place to learn. This also includes Madeline uh, Primergea, president of Miami Dade College, whose passion for education helped her achieve the role of the first female president of Miami Dade College and as the first female and first Hispanic chancellor of the Florida college system. By working with Take Stock and Children to make ch college accessible and affordable, Ms. Primergera is helping students break the cycle of poverty, complete high school, and pursue post-secondary education and careers. And while Congressman Kendrick Meek could not be here with us today, we are thank we he was thankful that we are recognizing his mother, Congresswoman Carrie Meek, who we lost unfortunately this past November. Congresswoman Meek was an educator a member of the Florida House, the first black woman to serve in the Florida Senate, and the first African-American elected from Florida to U.S. Congress since Reconstruction. She made significant contributions throughout her life for her community and her constituencies, from advocating for affordable housing to securing critical funding for Hurricane Andrew recovery. Her legacy stands as a role model to public servants, an inspiration as a teacher and administrator, and a champion of economic opportunity, inclusion, and democracy. And I'm also going to add one more to this list. We also need to recognize Kentanji Brown Jackson as going to be the first black female to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court 
And as a resident of, from born and raised in Miami-Dade, having gone to the same high school as Judge Jackson, um, it is just was such an honor as an attorney um, to watch her uh, for that week, um, the poise, the grace, and her willingness to stand up for all. And also as a past public defender, um, her service to our state and to this community has to be rewarded, recognized, and it will truly be our honor as the United States to have her sitting on the highest court of the land. So I want to once again express my gratitude to all the women recognized here today for their individual contributions, not just in their work, but also by providing an example of leadership and perseverance for future generations. Our state is stronger thanks to all of you and all the countless others who have fought to pave the way for future generations of women and girls to succeed. I know that I wouldn't be here today as the first female to serve as Florida's Commissioner of Agriculture without the many incredible women who came before me and lift me up every single day. It is so important that we each lift each other up, especially in these difficult times when our rights are being attacked and our freedoms are being stripped away, as we saw throughout this legislative session. While some may try to take away the progress that we all have made, we will remain united and keep pushing forward. And together, we will keep shattering glass ceilings and protect the truth we all know, that women's rights are human rights. Thank you again for all that you do, all that you have done, and all that I know you will continue to do. Um, thank you for being here today, and certainly we'll open up for questions. The governor yesterday uh, announced a call for a special session on redistricting. He also announced a few other things he'd like to consider. Uh, what are some of those things that you would like to see in a special session? You know, some things that we have been asking for the legislature to take up. Um, that is everything from property insurance to affordability of homes. Uh, the fact of the matter is we left session without addressing the condo collapse down in Surfside. These are all issues that are impacting people's lives every day. I would also hope that the legislature would take a relook at the gas tax. Why are we waiting until October? The people of our state are hurting today. Um, and unfortunately, they play partisan politics when it came to the gas tax um, and relief that should happen today. So there's a lot of things that need to be placed onto the agenda. I certainly hope that uh, the legislature is hearing the calls uh, that I know that I am hearing from, our constituents all across the state, that they're recognizing that their work this past legislative session was far from over. Commissioner, there are some lawmakers that are calling on your department to do more to strengthen ride security in the wake of that tragedy we saw last week. Where are you at with that request? Now, first of all, to the family um, and to everybody who's been impacted, obviously our hearts go out to them. Uh, no one should go to an amusement park um, and unfortunately have to leave without a member of their family. Um, our department is working around the clock uh, to get to the bottom of it. Um, to make sure that something like this never happens again. So we are in the middle of this investigation and we have been giving, as we get information in from um, whether it's the operators, whether it was the owners and from you know witnesses around, um, we are disclosing as much information as we're getting it and to be transparent about the entire process. Um, we certainly are going to be looking through our rules and our statutes to see if there's things that we can do for the future to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. It's too soon. I, I mean, I get briefed on this um, on a pretty consistent basis, but it is way too soon. There's a lot of engineers that are having to go through and a lot of just, you know, pulling back of layers. Um, so we are not going to jump to any conclusions until we know the facts. That would be not helpful to the family. Um, we want to be there every step of the way to make sure that we're uncovering exactly what happened uh, and make sure that whatever the situation was, that there could be preventative measures for the future. And what are your thoughts on Florida joining the, uh, the federal government over the mass media that You know, as I have said consistently for the last year and a half, um, and I have been very consistent on this point, I am not in favor of mandates or bans um, across the board. And that at this point, not just the state of Florida, but the country and the world have been given all of the tools 
that we have already accessible from technology and from research and from science of what we need to do to get in front of any additional spreading of, of COVID. Um, everybody knows what individual precautions need to be taken. Everybody has access, access to masks and vaccines. Um, and so it is our job as government, in my, per, in my review, um, to make sure we have the right information out there. And then let people make the decisions of what they believe is right for themselves, for their family, and for their community, and for their businesses. Um, so I am not in favor of mandates or um, bans when it comes for going forward in dealing with, the, with COVID. So then do you support the lawsuit? Um, I have not looked at the lawsuit, so I certainly, as an attorney, want to make sure I look through it uh, before I make any judgment calls on a lawsuit, um, but that's my general stance on, on the policy. Thank you.